Tonight on Philly Cam Voices, can the media do a better job of covering gun violence in communities? A summit at Temple University takes a closer look. New voting machines will be used during the up and coming November 5th election. Find out how they work and why some people are not happy about them. Plus, we'll take a look at the major races on the ballot November 5th. Good evening. Thank you for tuning in to the Philly Cam Voices. I'm your host, Amanda Johnson. We begin with a look at how the media covers gun violence. A summit at Temple University placed reporters and the victims of deadly shooting in the same room to have meaningful conversations. Our Connie Combe was there. On Saturday, September 7th, at Temple University Student Faculty Center, there was a unique gathering of community activists, journalists, mothers who lost loved ones to gun violence and community members impacted by gun violence coming together to discuss the media's role in covering it and how this coverage impacts the community. This summit was the brainchild of Jim McMillan, a fellow at the Reynolds Journalism Institute and director of the Initiative for Better Gun Violence Reporting. Speakers included Dorothy Johnson Spite, the founder of Mothers in Charge, and Dr. H. Jean Wright, a forensic pathologist. Dorothy Spite explains the purpose of the summit. This event has been created to bring together members of the community impacted by violence with journalists who play some role in the coverage of the issue. Conversations are intended to get to know each other better and create opportunities to ask questions and share ideas for how gun violence coverage could best serve the community. I asked Jim McMillan why he thinks it's so important to have a dialogue like this. The goal is that journalists who report on gun violence will be more connected to the community. Because we always talk about trauma-informed journalism and data-informed journalism, but I think we need more community-informed journal journalism when it comes to covering gun violence. So I'm hoping that by having, and, and literally we're going to have journalists and people f impacted in the community sitting together at the table, at the very least they're going to see each other and they're going to know who's on the other side. Hopefully they'll exchange some contact information, maybe some, some business cards, and they'll, all, and, and they'll both have more people they know on the other side. If, there'll be 15 meetings. If they only connect with two or three, it's going to be pretty good progress, right? Shana McMillan believes that when the media is covering a story, they should consider the families as well as the person who lost their life. Specifically, I would like the media to um, tell us who they are beyond just their name and the location of their death. Um, who they are for their family, who they are for their community, um, not just the circumstance of their death. Um, because those individuals who have passed, they are fathers, mothers, children, grandchildren, students, little league players, community leaders. Like who are, who is the individual that we're mourning, not just the circumstance of their death. Dr. H. Gene Wright states he sees a connection between behavioral health and gun violence. What I'm saying is people who have traumatic lifestyles, dealing with some things that come from social determinants, poverty, um, uh, again, uh, abuse, neglect, those kind of things, and then grow up with anger and hate things that have not been processed, those individuals tend to reach out and strike out against others. And so as the saying goes, hurt people hurt people. And so that's that connection between gun violence and behavioral health. And so I think it's the sensitivity that a journalist would need to have as you're coming into a neighborhood that maybe you do not live in, reporting on a situation that maybe you don't fully understand, and then putting on paper, if it's print journalism, or on camera, if it's that type of media, a respectful, knowledgeable, 
story that takes into consideration uh, both victim and perpetrator. Philadelphia Inquirer journalist Abraham Gutman explains why he attended the event. We also have the opportunity to search for solutions, to do evaluations, to, to elevate good work in the community that, that is solving, um, maybe not gun violence, but is solving you know, a sliver and, or a facet of it. Britt Christopher had this to say about the event. Um, I enjoyed this event. Um, I got enlightened a lot about this event and um, got some perspective and um, just good conversation with many people about gun violence and how we should stop it and how the media should reflect on it differently. Participants at this event came away with the belief that if the media and the community work together, gun violence could be reduced in Philadelphia. This is Connie Com for Philly Cam. New touchscreen voting machines will be used at the next city election on November 5th. Reporter Dennis Lynx explains how they work and why some people are not happy with the new machines. In November, Philadelphia voters will be using new machines to cast their ballot in the 2019 general election. Last February, the city commissioners chose to purchase 3,800 touchscreen machines. They're designed to record votes electronically while also keeping a trail of paper ballots. These will be the city's first new machines in 17 years, but the change has come with considerable controversy. The commissioners oversee elections in Philadelphia County. This move was prompted by an order from Governor Tom Wolf's administration that all Pennsylvania counties upgrade to voting systems that are more secure and leave a paper trail for auditing purposes. Despite opposition from activists and the city controller, the commissioner's office to date has conducted over 150 demonstrations throughout the city to help voters become more familiar with the technology. In a recent demo at Philly Cam, a handful of voters tried the machine. It features a 32-inch touchscreen unit called Express Vote XL, produced by Election Systems and Software, otherwise known as ESNS. Here's how it works. Each voter will be given a blank paper ballot. The person must insert this ballot into the machine, at which point it will be drawn inside automatically and secured. Next, the voter will select which language to see on the ballot. In this demo, the options were English and Spanish. Then, touch Start Voting. The screen shows all the candidates, grouped by elective office and by political party. As voters make selections, the spaces will light up. Just like with the old machines, people can vote for individual candidates or a straight party ticket. Of course, there's also option for write-in candidates and ballot question votes. After making selections, press Print Ballot. The previously inserted ballot will return from inside the machine, but behind a clear protective glass. This time, the ballot will have all selections printed on it for the voters' review, along with corresponding barcodes for electronic reading. If everything appears correct, press Cast Ballot. The paper ballot will automatically be pulled back into the machine and stored. The screen verifies the votes have been recorded by displaying a message, your votes were cast, thank you for voting. It bears mentioning that the new machines offer a tilt screen, wheels for maneuverability, and accessibility features for the visual or hearing impaired. Although it was a small sample size, the group who used the machines at Philly Cam felt positive about them. In many respects, the look of the ballot seemed similar to the old system, and it was rather easy to learn how to navigate it. However, there are many others who have also seen the machines and are mounting a fierce opposition. Leading the way is a group called Protect Our Vote Philly. It contends that the Express Vote Excel machines are too expensive, that the selection process was secretive and corrupt, and that it's a poor product which fails to secure the vote or guarantee privacy. At a recent city commissioner's board meeting, Protect Our Vote took to City Hall to protest a recent hiring decision. 
They say it illustrates the illegal involvement of recused commissioners Lisa Dealey and Al Schmidt in operational decisions. By law, both were forced to abdicate their positions during their re-election campaigns to avoid a conflict of interest. In the interim, their board seats were filled by judges Vincent Furlong and Giovanni Campbell. Protect Our Votes' Rich Gorella claims the current setup is effectively a sham, with the board simply playing figurehead to behind-the-scenes maneuvering by Dealey and Schmidt. James Marsh condemns what he sees as a lack of transparency in the bid process. A recent city controller report documented extraordinary ties between ES and S and the commissioners, including campaign contributions. Marsh believes design secrecy made it easy to rig the process for one favored vendor to win. The request for uh, proposal that was issued uh, for the machines specifically uh, favored a particular manufacturer by the way that the uh, RFP was written. In, uh, for example, the RFP said that the, the, the winning machine should have the same look and feel as a prior machine. You wouldn't know if, unless you have knowledge, but that particular phrasing actually favored the, uh, the vendor that eventually won, which is ESNS. The impetus for the state order was concern over foreign meddling in U.S. elections and the need to restore security and voter confidence. Protect Our Vote Philly's biggest concern is that these machines fail to meet that rudimentary goal. Activist Susie Mizell sounded off some apparent deficiencies. Part of the problem with these machines is that they're not secure. They run on Windows 7, which is end of life January 2020. Our first chance to vote on them is going to be November of, of 2019. Two months later, their software is going to be obsolete. And there's a barcode at the top, and then as, after you vote, after you vote, after you accept your choices, that the paper says what you want it to say, it goes back through the printer on its way to the lockbox. So any kind of malware, virus, whatever kind of hackings anyone wants to do can alter, void, or change your, change your ballot on its way back through and you would never ever know. Protect Our Vote Philly notes other concerns, such as an exorbitant $30 million cost plus the fact that sequential storage of paper ballots could compromise voter privacy if compared against an election rollbook. So, what system do they propose as the best solution? We want to see hand-marked paper ballots, flat yeah. out. Like, it's cheap, it's simple, everybody knows their votes count, and that's what we need. If we want people to turn out to vote, if we believe that voting matters, if we are a democracy, we need to make sure everybody has complete and utter faith in this system. On multiple occasions, Philly Cam Voices contacted Deputy Commissioner Nick Custodio, who is spokesman for the row office. We sought comment on the voting machines, but to date, there has been no response. For Philly Cam Voices, this is Dennis Link. Now, the city elections on November 5th. Joining me now is Vincent Thompson, principal of Thompson Media Man Communications and a longtime political reporter for Word Radio to explain what stakes and uh, talk about the key races now. Welcome to the studio. Thank you. It's back to be back. I haven't been here for a while. So this is going to be a good one. So you have been covering the elections, you have been covering the voting booths, but let's start off with this. 30, 30, 30 years I've been covering elections. So this is city. definitely going to be some good conversation. Mm -hmm. So in the market you go and they might ask you, do you want paper <laughs> or plastic? So now with all this change with the voting machines, they might be asking, do you want paper or not paper? <laughs> what, what's going on? Talk well, to us. Well, so, well let's, let's help people a little bit. For years, the city has had voting machines, and they've been touch screen, they've been touch pad voting machines. So you go in, there's a little red light that comes on, you push the light. That was more advanced than the old machines that were known as the shoot machines, and they were big, 
heavy, massive machines with levers. Literally, those things could, you could have an explosion and the machine would still be able to work because they were just massive machines. But the current machines are over 20 years old and that technology is, is obsolete. So what the city had to do and, and all the counties throughout Pennsylvania had to do was purchase brand new voting machines under a mandate from the governor, Governor Tom Wolf. Philadelphia has, uh, has purchased the machines that you just saw in the piece that came on in front of me, uh, $29 million, over 2,000 machines. And when you go, it's basically like a big television screen. And it's a touch screen. So you'll touch, it'll give you other instructions, and then at the end you have to push a green button on your uh, touch screen, and then it records your vote. Now there's a paper, there's a piece of paper that's fed through. Now some people want old-fashioned paper ballots where you circle them almost like you do an SAT test. I understand where some of the advocates are saying that might be safer, but I really wonder in a city like Philadelphia, where you have a million people registered to vote, would a paper ballot be that applicable? So there are a lot of people that don't like the new machines that are coming in. The city has spent $29 million on these machines. Um, they, the company that's providing the machines has to pay a $3 million fine. So no matter what, the city is already on the hook for $26 million for these machines. So like these machines or not, you're it's gonna stuck. be stuck with these machines for years to come. Um, one of the reasons that the city commissioners wanted to try the machines this year is because this election coming up in November is not a real heavy election. Um, so any kinks that are in the machines, they can work out. What they really wanna be prepared for is the 2020 presidential election when more people come out to vote. I like to call presidential elections sexy elections, right? Because people Why really, people, well, people really like it. It has a lot of hype. It has a lot of commercials. It has a lot of radio. It's more interesting than say your local municipal election. But I like to say, if I had to create a hashtag of politics, all elections matter. Because even though people might get excited about the president and their congressional leaders, your mayor, your city council people, what we're electing this uh, November, your judges have a lot more impact on your day-to-day -day quality of life than even the president, than even the Congress. So I tell people all elections matter. Uh, this election coming up in Philadelphia, you're going to have elections for judges. You're going to have elections for the mayor, uh, between Mayor Jim Kennedy, the incumbent, and Bill Cengalini, the Republican. You're going to have uh, all the district council members. There are 10 of them. Most of the district council people have very little competition, so they'll win election easily. The big race is really going to be the at-large races, where we have seven at-large members. Um, the Democrats have a certain amount of people on the ballot. The Republicans have a certain amount of people on the ballot. And then this year, there's a whole bunch of independents who have a, a chance of knocking out the Republicans on council. Most people don't know there are seven people who are allowed to be on city council at large. Uh, five are from the majority party, which in this town is Democrats and two are from the minority party. That minority party has generally been the Republicans, but it doesn't have to be under the charter. That is what those independents are trying to do, knock out the two Republicans, who in this case are David O. and Al Tautenberger. So that's gonna be a good race. That, that's the race I'm looking for all night on election night. <laughs> now, before we go into the candidates, mm -hmm. what are some of the pros and cons of the new machines, because I know literacy may play a key point. In that. Well, I think some of the pros of the machines are that they're newer, right? Uh, that they're touchscreen, so they're easier. Some of the cons have been, as you heard from the people who are against them, is two things. One, they are susceptible to hacking. They feel mm -hmm. that it's susceptible to hacking. And there is one major issue with these machines that I have brought up on my radio shows. Uh, which is City Council Live, which comes on every Thursday on Word, and also the Political Source, which comes on every Monday on Word. And that is the software for the machines. The machines use Windows 7 software. The problem with Windows 7 software is in a couple of months, you can't get Windows 7 software. You probably have a fresher version of Windows on your home computer than this machine has for voting. So why would you buy voting machines that are using a system that's obsolete? That could be a big problem. So if you have these machines for years and years and years and they're electronic and they're using an old system that you can't, how is the city going to patch that machine and get them to work? So no, most of the time machines don't work for any number of reasons. They don't power up. 
they can't open up the box, that kind of thing. How do you do a machine when the operating system is older than the year it's in? So I think that's the real con. <clears throat> I think that's the real cons of these machines. But like I said, the city's paying $29 million for these machines, so we're going to have to work out the kinks for years to come. They're not going to buy the machine, spend $29 billion, and then just only use them for a year or two. So you're going to get used to them. <laughs> now, what should the um, viewers or the voters mm -hmm. know about the race, and why should they go to the polls? Well, you should go to the polls because in a democracy, you have a right to vote, right? Most polling places in Philadelphia are less than eight blocks away from your house. So as I like to say, if you can get to the club by 11, you can get to voting twice a year, right? I mean, I mean, these are, the, you know, democracy isn't a spectator sport. You got to be involved in it, right? Yeah. One of the things that frustrate me is when people say, I want to complain about X or complain about Y. Well, did you go and vote? You say that, you say that the woman or the man's a bum for counsel, but you didn't go vote. You could have had, a, if you didn't like this person, you could have voted, right? And voting takes like five minutes. Walk to it, go vote, you're done. It's not like it takes you all day. In Philadelphia, it's not like there's huge lines. Trust me, this election, there's not going to be Obama-like lines around the corner. It'll be easy, simple. And these local races matter. You know, the next mayor is going to uh, be around for four years. Uh, the city council members are going to be around for four years, impacting taxes and budgets and schools. Um, you've got a new sheriff that's going to be elected this year in uh, Rochelle Belial. You've got a new Register of Wills in uh, Tracy Gordon. So there are important races. People complain about judges, right? Uh, the system's rigged against people because, I, because of that judge. Well, if there are judges that you want in and you don't vote, you know, complaining, you know, it, it, everybody has a right to complain. But in democracy, you have a right to have your say. So I urge people to check on their registration. You can do that by calling your county board of elections. Uh, you can go to a website called Votes, P-A, that's V-O-T-E-S, P-A. Type in your address and your name. It'll come up. It'll tell you if you're registered to vote. It'll tell you where your ward and division is in Philadelphia, where you're scheduled to vote at. In Philadelphia, you can also call the city commissioner's office. Those are the folks that are responsible for voting. If you're watching and you live in the suburbs, call your suburban county board of elections. They'll be able to tell you. So offices are open to help you with voting. All right. So let's talk about the 10th district race right. between Judy Moore and Brian O'Neill. Yes, right. that's a great race. Right now, Philadelphia has 10 district council people. Nine of them are Democrats. The only district council that has a Republican in council is Brian O'Neill. Brian O'Neill has been around in council for 40 years. He's the... He's the longest serving councilman currently. To tell you how far back he goes, he was sworn in when Wilson Good was sworn in as mayor. That's how far back he goes. Uh, he's had competition in the past, but they haven't really been Democrats that have had a lot of money and hasn't been the right time for him. This election, he has a Democrat who's going to be supported by unions and Judy Moore. He has a Democrat in a city that's overwhelmingly Democrat and the Northeast starting to become more Democrat. So that is going to be a good race. Brian O'Neill has a race in front of him. I would still think Brian O'Neill could eke it out, but I would not be surprised if Brian O'Neill lost. And if that would happen, history would be made because it would be the first time in Philadelphia history that all 10 of the district council are Democrats. It's the first time in recent memory. So it would be the first time. All right. So let's talk about the race at the large at large races. Mm -hmm. So we have seven seats up for grab. Right. The incumbents are Councilman at Large Allen Dome. Allen Dom, right. Derek Green, mm -hmm. Helen Jim, right. David O, and Al Tannenberger. Tannenberger, right. Tell us about this race. Okay, well, uh, there are seven at large members of city council. Okay, five of them are from the majority party, as I said earlier. Two are under our city charter have to be elected from the minority party. Now, the minority party can be any party. Normally, it's the Republicans, right? Because we haven't had strong, independent candidates run. This year, you're going to see a ballot where you're going to see five Democrats, including some of the Democrats that you named, five Republicans, 
including the two that you named, David O. and Al Tallenberger. And then you're going to have a slew of independents, okay? There's a political party called the Working Families Party. And because I don't want to give any names to be all fair, um, they have been the ones that have been front and center. They have gotten endorsements from some of the Democratic um, members of city council. Helen Gim has been one. Some of the other um, state reps have endorsed them. So what the Working Family Party is trying to do is knock out the Republicans. Like, they don't care if they knock out one, they want to knock out both. So they are really going after David O. and Al Tautenberger. Also, the Republicans that are listed on the ballot are also trying to go after David O. and Al Tautenberger, too. So that's going to be an interesting race. I still would think, and I'm just putting on my pontification hat here, it still is probably the incumbents to lose, David O. and Al Tautenberger. But I would not be surprised if November 6th, we would have brand new at-large members starting to serve in January because all of the new council start serving in January of next year for a four-year term. All right, good information. Now, let's talk about the race for sheriff. Okay. Not, so, not much of a race anymore. <laughs> not much so, of a race. So we have Rochelle Bilal, right. and she's running unopposed, unopposed, right. but she's kind of taking over for Sheriff Joel Williams. Right which had a little controversy going on. Talk to us about that. Well, Joel Williams ran for re-election in a crowded field. Uh, Joel Williams has been alleged to have had um, uh, misdeeds with uh, sexual harassment. He denies them all. So I want anybody who is supporting the sheriff to know that I said that he publicly has said that he denies them all. The pe he still has lawsuits against him, uh, mm -hmm. civil lawsuits against him. He denies them all. I think that was one of the things that helped him lose re-election. Uh, Rochelle Bilal was able to come out of that as the top vote-getter. Rochelle Bilal is the longtime president of the Guardian Civic League, which is the organization that represents African-American police officers. So she's going to come in and serve four years as sheriff. It's going to be interesting to see what kind of changes she makes to the sheriff's office. Most people, the sheriff's office really does a couple of things. One, they protect the courts. And they also are responsible for prisoner transport to and from the prisons. But they also deal with sheriff sales, the controversial sheriff sales of homes. So, you know, how is that program going to be revamped? Uh, will it be fairer to people for sheriff sales? Will it be more strict with people for sheriff sales? So that's going to be one of the big things that she's going to have to deal with when she comes into office in January. So she's unopposed. So you'll see one name on the ballot for sheriff. She'll be the only one. Now, you can write a name if you want. Trust me, we have elections where Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck and every, there's going to be names on that ballot that you'll, you can write in yourself. You are legally allowed to write in yourself. If you think you would be a better sheriff or a city council person, you are allowed on the machine to write in your name. Trust me, at the end of the, at, when we see a vote, there's going to be a vote for Mickey Mouse, Donald Duck. There could be a vote for Amanda. <laughs> Amanda could vote for herself. I could vote for myself. So you're, you're allowed to do that. But that she'll, is she'll interesting win. that you said that because they said in certain places, characters have won. And <laughs> they're well, official. Well, Philadelphia is a city of characters. So, yeah, we, we, we have lot lots of, of them. A lot of them. Not, not Donald Duck or Goofy, but we have a lot of characters. We it's might always, have some Goofies, though. It's always interesting <laughs> to cover politics in Philly. I tell people I've never had a dull moment covering politics in this town. So we have new registers um, of Will, right. Tracy Gordon. Right. She'll, she's on the post. She's not. She's not there yet. <laughs> yeah. Well, the new register. She'll, so she'll be there soon. Yeah. She she's on the post too. Running on a post. So talk to us a little bit about well, that. Well, she defeated Ron Donatucci, mm -hmm. the longtime register of Will's, and basically the register of Will's office is that office where, just like it says, it's the register of Will. So your will, your probate, your marriage license goes into that office. And it controls a lot of money, too. So the question is going to be, you know, how does, she, how does Tracy Gordon deal with money, making a little fair system? Um, so it's going to be interesting. So next year, when council, when we have an inauguration on January the 6th next year, mm -hmm. there'll be an inauguration with at least three new members of council because they won in the primary. We could have new members that are elected based upon November. Mm -hmm. We'll have... Let's assume, for the sake of argument, that Mayor Jim Kenney wins re-election. Wow. We will have 
a brand new sheriff. Now I'm glad and we will have a brand new uh, city council. You got some good information, but they can turn into the show right. and get more information because we got that. But thank you for tuning in to Philly Cam Voices, and we'll see you next time.